Hello everybody, um, we're going to start our event uh, first with a recitation of the Holy Quran by Mokhtar uh, Chitin Lina and he is going to recite the first five ayahs of Surah Baqarah, which is a, the second chap uh, chapter. Those who believe in the unseen and keep up prayer and spend out of what we have given to them. And who believe in that which has been revealed to you and that which has revealed before you and they were sure of the hereafter. These are on the right course from their Lord and these it is that shall be successful. Welcome to WLU-MSA's first event of the term in conjunction with the Religion and Culture Department at WLU. My name is Sarah and I'm the Marketing Exec of MSA. And also MC with me tonight is Huzaifa, who's the president over there. Um, so we decided to start off with an event that reflects what's happening in our current Canadian context today. So the ban of the Nifab, which is the face veil, is... Um, during the Canadian Citizenship Oath was just put into action last month, and this is one of the most controversial topics in recent Canadian affairs, as well as in Islamic dialogue. Many Muslims and non-Muslims alike have disputed the niqab and have had questions and concerns regarding the freedom and equality of women wearing the face veil. So today we're just going to provide you with a lens onto a Muslim woman's perspective in response to the often distorted media biases that we're commonly exposed to. Our program for tonight will commence with a spoken word piece by Fatima Atir. Then, each of our four panelists will discuss their personal informed opinions of the issues based on the following categories. Religion, education, politics and constitution, and progress. After the discussion by the four panelists, we will open up the floor to questions. I would now like to introduce Fatima Atir will be presenting a spoken word, word poem for us this evening. <laughs> Fatima is a fourth year student at Laurier studying religion, culture, and philosophy. Please direct your attention. Assalamu alaikum. Um, this is a piece that I just finished yesterday, so I'm sorry. I apologize, I don't memorize it, so I'll be reading it off my phone. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hijab, niqab. Burka abaya jilbab. These terms to you may mean oppression, but it's not based on your impression. It's my freedom of expression. I'm free when I'm free to dress how I please. I'm free when I'm able to follow the decree, whether it's my ancient religion or country's fallible traditions. Freedom to me is when I dress how I feel, speak what I think, and believe in my faith. Freedom to me is when justice prevails. We shall overcome. So don't tell me I don't belong. My rights and freedoms given are strong. This land was made for you and me is what I sang in a childhood song. So when it's me and you, you cannot eliminate me because me is equal to you. Our views may be different, but our creed is just one. Our perspectives change and develop with every passing sun. But equality is written in the democracy of our current legal policies. If we follow these legalities, we'd avoid these hypocrisies. Freedom is what I ask. And freedom is my demand. Freedom is our destiny. We shall overcome. 
This is the anthem of the past. How about we bring it back as the same oppressions continue to last? We shall overcome. As will be seen before thee, my sisters may interpret differently, but for we don't follow monolithically, but she's still my sister Islamically and in humanity. I'll support her right until the end. Every minute I'll spend to defend. We shall overcome. These freedoms I intend to fight for until the end. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. That was a beautiful and powerful piece by Fatima. So try and contemplate these ideas and keep them in mind for the following presentations. I'd now like to introduce the first panelist to you, Asma Bala. Asma Bala is a PhD student at the University of Waterloo in the Department of Religious Studies. Her current research interest examines the um, interaction of the Muslim community with the secular liberal state. Her focus is primarily on Muslim organizations and how they negotiate tensions on behalf of their pro religionists within the Canadian context. So please direct your attention towards this Jasmine. It's very difficult to uh, follow with that piece from Fatima, but I guess I might sound boring just reading in prose, but I beg you to just bear with me. I'm not going to be too long. Um, so on December 12th of uh, 2011, just about less than a month ago, Immigration Minister Jason Kenney announced that persons seeking to take the oath of citizenship would be required to uncover their face. So now, to be Canadian meant to remove any obstruction to a person's mouth so that the act of taking oath of citizenship would be seen as well as heard. And uh, mind you, this is just one piece of becoming a citizen. There's a test to write and there's a process that you have to go through to then get to this point. So this is the last step. The problematic nature of Kenny's rush decision cannot be understated, nor can the slippery slope of events under this government be ignored. From referring to Islamicism as the greatest threat to Canadian security, um, to the government's wishy-washy stance on Bill 94, which was, of course, some of you remember, the proposed niqab ban in Quebec, it has become apparent that there is a concerted effort to manage the difference, and I'm saying that in scare, in scare, scare quotes, within the Canadian state. Though unnamed in this announcement, it was intended for a small population of niqab wearing women who seek to take the oath of Canadian citizenship. According to theorist Ghassan H, this indicates a desire of, I guess, Kenny, as a, what I'm going to call him, a liberal multiculturalist, to manage the difference that exists in the public sphere and in public space, spaces as well. He would see himself as gatekeeper to Canada, and through his announcement, he tells niqab wearing women that they are welcome to join the rest of us, but they must abide by a dress code that is approved by his ministry. Though through this process, Kenny seeks to manage who enters and joins the Canadian fold. He is not merely policing women's dress choice, of course. He is redefining citizenship and what it means to become a Canadian. My question there would also be, what of the women who are Nikabi and were born Canadian, or the women who prior to this announcement took the oath of citizenship with the Nikab? Now, of course, I'm not here to discuss the religious justification for Nikab wearing. I'm sorry if that's what you're here for. I can't help you with that. That debate should and will continue long after the issue dies and becomes another event from the Harper era. To share a little bit of my own research on Muslim organizations in relation to the debate, I found that groups that are for and against the ban have one thing in common. They are all preoccupied with governmental interventions into religious conviction and dress choices of Muslim women. The most prominent organization for the ban is the Muslim Canadian Congress, who has long argued that the niqab must be banned as it is a symbol of oppression and Islamic extremism that should have no place in a liberal democratic society. Moreover, they have argued that the niqab has no basis in Islam, and that women wearing the niqab are not able to carry out tasks requiring peripheral vision, such as driving, and they would suffer from, the niqab wearing women would suffer from a vitamin D deficiency. We have seen the issue of niqab come up over and over again, beginning with the possible voting restrictions with identity requirements, and then to the case of a woman wearing niqab who is the complainant in a sexual assault trial who has asked that she be allowed to keep her face covered while testifying against the accused. That decision is still pending. Most notably would be the proposed Bill 94 in Quebec, which is currently halted, but I'm guessing that it will be revisited in light of the recent citizenship oath requirement. On the other hand of the spectrum, most organizations against the ban have taken the stance as a matter of human rights 
and they've taken their stands out of respect for the civil liberties for niqab wearing women. These have included prominent Muslim organizations such as the Canadian Council of American Islamic Relations, also known as CARECAN, the Muslim Lawyers Association, the Canadian Islamic Congress, and others. In particular, for Bill 94, um, the No to 94 campaign, I'm sure some of you have heard of this, attracted a number of non-Muslim groups who stood in solidarity with a woman's right to choose her dress. All of these organizations have determined that no individual should be barred or forced to wear clothing that challenges their fundamental belief. This is not only the case for a country like France and Canada, who seek to prevent women from covering. It extends to countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran, where in some areas, women are forced to cover against their will. Considering the niqab may be a forced convention for some Muslim women, we cannot overlook those women who seek to exercise their agency and identity and use the niqab as a means to express their individu individuality or religious conviction. According to Will Klim Kimlicka, a prominent theorist of liberal multiculturalism, states that are committed to multiculturalism must protect minorities from repressive practices that are committed at the hands of some within their community. I then ask, but then what of repressive practices perpetrated by the state, which violates a woman's sincerely held belief? The policy in question makes the assumption that the niqab wearing women are not exercising their agency or are insincere. Even worse, the assumption may be that their belief is not valid. What the government is doing is legislating on the basis of public discomfort. It is also a regressive policy when considered within the framework of liberal multicultural policy in a secular democratic state. Recur re returning again to the uh, citizenship ceremonies that we're actually here to probably talk about more so, I can't really get into the logistics of how they work, but I do know that some of these are very large. So there would be a few hundred people at any given time. I can only hypothesize on how the judge is supposed to be able to see everyone's mouth moving at the time of oath giving. Um, but nonetheless, this argument has been used to justify the policy. To conclude, this case raises a number of questions, including what will be the next, I guess, uh, policy on the legislating block. Will existing Canadian Nikabi space laws, such as those that were proposed in Quebec, which limit their access to public services? Will other forms of religious dress fit into what it means to be Canadian? I can only speculate, but it appears that this government is, I guess, preoccupied with governing women's bodies and indicates that we have entered a new era in religion and state relations. Thank you.